Claire Larson, uh, whom I mentioned, uh, uh, we are working together with uh, on digital authorship, a senior lecturer at uh, Université Paris 8 in, uh, in Paris. Her research focuses on contemporary British literature, including David Mitchell, Ian McEwan, Graham Swift, Ned Boyman, and translation studies, including, oh, sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> including uh, digital tools and economics, and digital humanities more broadly. She co ran a four-year Lebex funded research project called Le Sujet Digital, uh, Digital Subject, between 2012 and 2015, and the 2016 Series Symposium on Post-Human and Digital Subjectivities. And she's currently, currently guest editing, oops, that's okay. She's currently guest editing a special issue of uh, the Revue Angle on Digital Subjectivities. Thank you. So, Hello. Um, and I just need, sorry, I should have said this up before, so I'm just going to just, if you could launch the slideshow. And then I just need to press this button. Yeah? Okay. Lovely. Well, thank you, Erica, for the opportunity to participate in this thrilling event. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your presentations. Um, as Erica said, um, uh, I'm not really a specialist of electronic literature, so what I will present here is something from a slightly different perspective. There are echoes. Um, now, let's see if that works. Going down? Going down. On this 8th of March, first I'd like to give you a word of caution. Watch out for Erica. Um, so, as you can see, that Erica, that, can you see her? Okay. That Erica is capable of holding conversations with humans thanks to speech generation algorithms, facial recognition technology, and infrared sensors. Now, our Erica, Lancaster's Erica, we know she's capable of all this and much, much more. So, humans still retain an advantage. However, that Erica, um, an android recently created by a famous Japanese roboticist, Ishiguro, is um, scheduled to become a news anchor for Japanese TV as of this April, so roughly in a month's time. She can read the prompter just fine, she won't age, and she won't go on strike over pensions. <laughs> uh, this is one of the many examples of the combination of robotics and artificial intelligence. And that's what I'd like to focus on. And the issue I'd like to raise today is whether we can consider those androids as digital authors and I'd like to see what are the issues involved in that and, and um, um, so this leads me to wonder whether we should mourn human authors and I have one example which will be uh, very typically French even excruciatingly French French telly so I'm thinking of what was known as the Série de l'été, and it was absolutely always the same plot. A young, brave, and beautiful woman who was going to stand up against entrenched conservatism and usually corporate evil to defend her relatives, her endangered heirloom, and the spirit of the terroir. She has a traumatic past, but will find love in the end, and you always can count on the motherly figure to bring yummy local food. How much more French can you go? But it was the identical plot year after year. The only thing that really changed is the location, promotion of tourism in France. Mm -hmm. So really this could have been bot work. No need of human script writers for that. Um, now let's talk a bit more about the context in artificial intelligence. What is interesting in that slide is um, the dates. Artificial intelligence is nothing new. It's been here since the 50s. What's new is increased computational power and access to a wealth of data. I suppose you meant 1952. Right? <coughs> yes, I meant 1952, sorry. <laughs> sorry, that's, 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 that's future work. Um, and um, so the idea is beyond the web and what is usually considered as digital, are we moving towards an era where we'll have AI everywhere? Well, pretty much so. We already have all of the above. 
we have Watson, we have the infamous Cambridge Analytica, we have our phones, we have our GPS. I've been, um, this uh, winter, I've been focusing on uh, research on artificial intelligence applied to translation, otherwise known as neural machine translation, and I've been checking systematically the uh, 50 most relevant research articles published on Google Scholar and ResearchGate for the year 2017. And that is quite interesting because um, it's multilingual but not in the way we used to know it. That is to say, English remains the key uh, language both for research publication and in terms of research as one of the pivots. But the second most important language is Chinese, as you can see here, and the third one is German. Most of the research currently happening in translation usually deals with English, Chinese, and German. Some of it, Chinese, the, the couple Chinese-Japanese, and when it goes multilingual, it usually includes Czech, Russian, and Finnish. And uh, that's really interesting. And I've been also looking at where the research is happening. As you can imagine, a lot of it is happening in Anglo-Saxon countries, mostly New York University, John Hopkins University, Stanford University, Carnegie Mellon. For the UK, that would be the University of Edinburgh. And, but it's largely happening in China. So Chinese Academy of Science, Harbin University, Nanjing University, several universities in Beijing, Korea, Japan, in Germany, uh, University of Trier, Karlsruhe Institute, Poland, um, a little bit in Italy, almost nothing in France. And uh, another characteristic of that research is that it is co-funded by uh, global firms that have an interest in providing multilingual content. Let me name them. Facebook AI Research, Google Brain, Microsoft Brain, uh, Microsoft Research, Tencent AI Lab, Baidu, um, Huawei, Booking.com, etc. So that's, that's the landscape. Now I'd like to focus on what is actually happening when you have AI producing um, content. And so very basically you'll have computer writes and computer says. What happens when they write? Well, things like that happen. So that was this winter. I'll start with the uh, uh, bottom news. That was the, um, the flagship program of the BBC, the radio program today. Um, in the week between um, Christmas and New Year's Eve, they had um, a treats for us. So Prince Harry as guest editor and a bot. Okay, that's the uh, a bit of a gimmick. But you have something else. There was an article published in The Economist focusing on are bots going to replace, to replace journalists? And let me show you how it runs more in detail. So in orange you have what was written by the journalist and in black what was written by the bot that had been fed a number of articles from the science section of the economy. So obviously it doesn't work and the journalist was reassured. Um, <laughs> but the sentence is, well of, of course it's a short um, selection of what the bot produced. They don't mean anything, but they are grammatically correct. And presumably that's because the bot didn't receive precise instructions. It's just about the volume of articles. He was not given a specific topic. And um, in terms of um, what is more impressive is, that's more my field, neural machine translation. So um, again, this is very recent. Google switched its statistical machine translation, I was kind of okay but not very good, to the, its neural machine tra translation program in November 2016. There was a German company, DeepL, the one behind Lingui, that some of you may have used, uh, released its 
um, neural machine translation in August 2017. So here you have in orange another a list of other um, software. The point is that instead of matching segments, they're going to predict the machine as it writes is going to predict the next word and that's very much what we are doing that's as humans when we speak sometimes our speech falters that's because we're predicting and predicting is a bit unpredictable so we bug that's what we do but that's how these machines work and to just give you an idea is out of the Cherkov 4600 total articles on your own machine translation you have a little less than 3,000 published in 2017 alone. So this is really happening now. Um, let's go into more detail. Okay, I'm sorry, maths. <laughs> because um, uh, most of the people dealing with neural machine translations are mathematicians, computer scientists, and physicists. Instead of describing language the way you, we use it with syntax and semantics, lexicon. Um, they, they use language models and word pieces. So not words as we know them, but elements within the words. And then they feed that into an encoder-decoder framework. So you feed the source, natural language source, into an encoder that will transform language into semantic vectors and these semantic vectors will be decoded into the target language okay but that means that we have vectors that can function multilingually because they're semantic they correspond to concepts not natural language words and um, instead of using rules, grammatical rules, they are using, that's, I'm, I'm reaching the limit of my knowledge, my technical knowledge, but they're, re they're using layers of information, quite like the brain uses layers of information. They are not using grammatical rules, that's the point, okay? And um, it's attention-based, so it, again, it works like our brains. Um, if I look at a text, I'm not going to read each individual word. I and you are going to focus on keywords. That's why sometimes we make mistakes, because we've been reading too quickly and our attention has missed some of the elements. It's very important attention mechanisms. It also has to do with how we uh, deal with a visual information. Whenever we look at a screen or at um, a landscape, we don't look at everything, we looked at significant, significant elements and all of you who've worked on screen know that. Um, that's, so that's how it works. And I'm going to quote um, one of the articles and they boast that they have obtained state-of-the-art performance for several language pairs using only parallel data for training and minimal linguistic information. Okay, so apparently the computers can do it without us. No, because to work, they need to be fed by millions of utterance and statements, back translations, or pivotal matching. So they still need human, um, human uh, texts. What happens now when computers say things? The example I will take is that of digital assistants. So, um, the idea is that computers can not only author text, but they can author dialogue. Or rather, they generate text and they generate dialogues. That's the proper phase. And um, it's definitely multimodal. They're both um, using text, dialogue, and image recognition. Image recognition. So, Siri is for Apple, Alexa is for Amazon, Cortana is for Microsoft. Um, I don't know if you've ever used digital assistants. Basically, there are apps on your phones or your computers, and you can ask them to do things, like you're talking to your computer, and you'll say something like, Siri, please check the opening hours of the swimming pool today. Or you can do, Alexa, buy me the dollhouse that was shown on the commercial. That's a real-life um, um, scandal, because of the Alexa 
um, it was a little girl and reportedly she was seeing a TV ad in the States and she wanted that and, and Alexa the computer bought the doll. <laughs> so um, uh, it, it, you still have bugs. The point is you can see that it's kind of multilingual. Apple has 21 languages localized for 36 countries and Cortana has eight languages localized for 13 countries. So they have um, English, Portuguese, French, simplified Chinese, German, Italian, Japanese, Spanish. And in terms of English, they have five Englishes, Australia, Canada, India, United Kingdom and United States. Okay, these figures are as of March 2017. This comes with bugs and problems, so I'm sorry you maybe can't really read that, but the, the true, the, the core issue is that the language settings are not really language settings, they are market settings. It's usually designed for the uh, American English, and then only they expand to billable areas. The pairing is systematic between a language and a country or geographic entity because of commercial and legal requirements. I quote, if you change your region, you might not be able to shop at Microsoft Store or use things you've purchased like memberships and subscriptions, games, movies and TV. So if you use English but you change your region from America to India, then you're in trouble. And this guru goody um, commented uh, on GitHub that he couldn't use his um, Alexa in India because the settings were buggy. I think presumably he bought it in, in America and couldn't use it in India. And um, these digital assistants, they have skills, you can add skills, but um, as of today, those skills are usually only supported in the American English locale. Um, so you have the, the, the key issue that, that is what is now the role of humans in those industries? Um, as it happens, uh, humans end up working for the machine. Um, I, give you, um, I give you an example that you uh, can find on the website uh, Disruptive Asia. And they say that at Microsoft, they have an editorial team of 29 people customizing Cortana for local markets. For example, in Mexico, there was a published children, children's book author who would be writing Cortana's lines to stand out from other Spanish-speaking countries. Or at Apple, the company started working on a new language by bringing in humans, of all things, to read passages in a range of accents and dialects, which are then transcribed by hand, so the computer has an exact representation of the spoken text to learn from. That's a bit of a paradox, isn't it? <laughs> um, which brings me to my last uh, issue here. No, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's just to show you what they do. Text to voice, voice to text, voice to voice, whatever. And sometimes you even have computers speaking to computer. Um, and the important thing is they want to integrate language widgets into most devices. That's the Internet of Things. You can talk to your fridge. And um, you have Luis is an app of, for example, natural language recognition that Microsoft is developing to be integrated in all kinds of online programs so that you can speak to your computer and the program will do whatever they need to do. Now, are we going towards a moment where we have peopleware? Uh, peopleware is um, a phrase that exists and it refers to human talent as a kind of commodified piece of an IT process and a key part of providing various technical business models and other planning resources. One of the well-known example of people where would be the um, crowdsourcing workers from the net. Um, anonymous, fragmented contributions by non-professionals. And how it's worked, the idea is that errors and biases will be washed out in the sea of output of those um, crowd-working people. That's an example you can find on the website of Amazon Mechanical Turk. 
DARPA, the uh, American Defense, they've been commissioning a Mechanical Turk to translate 1.5 million words of Arabic posted on social media, not for defense specialists, for the machine used by DARPA. The point is that these translations were not to be read by humans, they were used to feed the machine training so that DARPA could monitor um, Arabic people, is, uh, people expressing themselves in Arabic on social media all over the world. Um, so humans feeding the machine. What happens again in terms of multilingualism is that again on Mechanical Turk you get bonuses if you speak um, foreign languages. That is to say, you know, you know you're being paid rewards per task, and that's usually cents. But you have bonuses uh, if um, th that's for su uh, surveying. It's, uh, they use the crowdsourcing to conduct online surveys, usually for marketing purposes. So if you're married, it's um, 50 cents, and if you're single, it's 50 cents. If you usually buy toys online, it's 40 cents extra money you get per task. But if you speak basic Brazilian Portuguese, it's one dollar. It's the most expensive item. If you speak um, basic German, it's one dollar again. So it's another view of multilingualism as like a bonus, but you know, very small bonus. And. Um, what is happening in translation is some of the major players that are using machine translation, neural machine translation, they boast they can support 550 language pairs. That's only science, it's, um, an Asian uh, company. They can only do that, of course, because they use neural machine translation, and they can only do it in 30 domains because they have fed the machines. Okay. Um, so it's really mass production, mass uh, multilingualism, but it's not the multilingualism we tend to think of. And I'm going to end on this quote, which was from the bot in The Economist, the bot writing, in the, and he actually produced that. Remember I said, I said he, not it. It works, the illusion works. Okay. It's a bit scary, but it, does resemble what I've been showing. And so conclusion is these tools, this artificial intelligence is going to redefine how we view language and how language is used in the human machine interaction. My contention is that it in the long term it will unpack the definition of authors and that's what I'm interested in. And there may be um, um, even more concentration on two key central languages, English and Chinese. There's going to be standardization through templates and statistics. Um, lots of issues. Can we delegate the production of, an, of meaning to um, this artificial intelligence? What about the notions of property and appropriation? What about the uh, monetization of these things? So to me, it seems that AI coupled with multilingualism is a bit like the industrial far west of the 21st century. And, but I'd like to end on, an, on another note for us humans. You, you see that I've mentioned mechanical turret, which is really like mass factory of low paid people. But they've established something called Turkopticon. And the people working have uh, used the web to establish a um, a monitoring tool for bad, um, bad, um, how could I say that? Um, um, bad works or, or bad payers, etc., faulty payers, and so it goes both ways. You see, you can use it, even the people in Mechanical Turks have found a way to um, counter this massive dominance, kind of. Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. I wanted to end up on something a little more positive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. That's and that's the end of my piece.